you um, mentioned. The physical newspapers are housed here in the archives. Um, and also we have other copies um, that are microfilm format, which is located at the Branson Library uh, microfilm area. Various local uh, Las Cruces Mesilla based newspaper holdings include uh, the following. La Estrella, La Flor de Valle, El Fronterizo, La Gaceta Popular, El Eco de Rio Grande, El Eco del Valle, El Defensor del Pueblo. The titles just mentioned are not the entire listing of newspaper publications, but a sampling of holdings specific to the Las Cruces Messier area. On a side note, um, one may wonder how did we acquire these newspapers, but um, the fiscal newspapers came from the Amador family papers. Uh, which we are fortunate enough that the family saved in these newspapers. The Amador's intentions uh, for preserving the newspapers may have not been uh, for research, but for, but for preserving a written record of their Spanish culture. Uh, while analyzing the Spanish language newspapers, we noticed some commonalities among newspapers, and my colleague Teddy will explain our findings. The history of Spanish language journalism in New Mexico began in 1834 when a trader on the Santa Fe Trail came from St. Louis, Missouri to Santa Fe. He brought the Ramage Press with him. Um, he used it to produce, well, they used it to produce a newspaper called El Crepúsculo de la Libertad. Later in about 1847, the Washington Hand Press came on the scene just in time for the printing of the Santa Fe Republican, which we know today as the Santa Fe New Mexican. Let's change these notes here, sorry. Not good as this is Jennifer. She's very seasoned at giving presentations. <laughs> um, so travel by the railroad expanded the Southwest. And so some of the oldest Hispanic communities found their culture to be looked down upon and their property threatened and the very existence sometimes was called into question by newcomers. And so these Hispanic communities quickly began to form and protect their language and their culture. And so in comes the Spanish language presses. One of the major outlets for this resistance was the Spanish language newspaper. Uh, Spanish poetry, letters, fiction, and essays helped bridge the gap between the Hispanic oral cultural expression and the print-oriented culture of the Americans. Us Hispanics didn't write down our stories so well. And so if it were not for the Spanish language presses, uh, much of this history would be lost. Many well-known writers, um, Latino writers got their start in Spanish language presses. Uh, the works of Jose Escobar, Felipe Chacon, Luis Tafoya, and Benjamin Reed, to name a few. These men expressed the diversity of the role of the Spanish language played in articulating our cultural identity. And for example, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, Isidoro Armijo from Mesilla. Uh, his story in 1911, 60 Minutos in Los Infiernos, was published in Spanish in the newspaper Alco de Valle in 1911. In 1912, it was uh, published in English, poorly translated, by the way, just <laughs> to make note of that. Um, but it's a story of a, a woman who, who leaves her husband for another man. And in her, she writes him a parting letter. And in her letter, she expresses how unhappy she is being married to him and that she feels like he's not in love with her anymore. His business is more important to him than she is. And so she writes him this long, drawn out, dramatic letter, as, as Hispanics are known to do <laughs> with drama. And she uh, leaves it for him to find when he comes home from work. Well, while she is at the train station with her um, new man, she has a change of heart and she decides she needs to get home to get back to this letter and destroy it. But unbeknownst to her, her husband arrives home from work two hours early and reads the letter. And she finds him at home having written his own letter, which was a suicide letter. Now, I don't want to tell you the ending of the story because that's Isadoro's story to tell. But I do want to recommend that you read the, uh, if you have a moment to look at the Norton, um, let me see if I get the title correct, the Norton Anthology of uh, Latino Literature, because there's a lot of well-known writers in there that you've heard of and a lot that you haven't heard of. And a lot of these authors are from New Mexico. Um, the other writer I'd like to discuss is Benjamin Reed. He is the leading authority on Latino history in New Mexico, especially. 
Um, Reed became a lawyer and a speaker of the New Mexico House of Representatives. In 1910, he began publishing a series of um, historical uh, works looking at history from the point of the Latino speaker or the Hispanic uh, population. Uh, his view on history considered both the ethnic and the cultural viewpoints of the Latino people. It was a rare look at, at for his time, it was a rare look. Um, his book, Historia Ilustrada de Nuevo Mexico was published in 1911 and translated into English as the Illustrated History of New Mexico. And that was published in 1912. And since that time, that book has been reprinted 30 times. Um, observation about the Spanish language presses not having uh, the longevity that their English counterparts had, had much to do with the economic difficulties of sustaining a newspaper. And the low readership was due to the lack of opportunities for education for some of the Spanish speakers. But as Jennifer mentioned, there were many Spanish language presses uh, during that time. And as just as soon as one went under, for whatever reason, there was another one to take its place. Pedro Garcia de la Lama was born in Cadiz, Spain in 1953. Sometime, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me see if I can get this animation going for you. There you go. Sometimes his birthday is, appears as 1863, but that's incorrect. He lived in Mexico and Arizona and spent some time in Veracruz, Mexico, where he served as consular for Mexico. We know he was married at least two times and possibly three. Um, his obituary states that he is survived by a wife and uh, five sons and four daughters. A wife's name is never mentioned and uh, looking at ancestry.com for his um, death certificate, it shows him as widowed. So we're not sure if he was married to twice or thrice. When Pedro was 15 years old, naval forces mutinied in Cadiz and uh, Queen Isabella II was exiled and many of her soldiers defected to, uh, to Mexico. Pedro and his brother Arroyo were both educated in the Jesuit school there in Cadiz. There may have been a time where they were considering the priesthood because both Pedro and Aurelio were involved in various social outreach uh, programs and especially in the care of migrants. And so I'm thinking this may have been the start of Pedro's lifelong advocacy and desire to form social change. His brother went on to be a doctor, by the way, in San Antonio, Texas. Soon after the queen was exiled, Pedro moved to Veracruz to join the Naval Academy. And then later on, he joined the Mexican army and received the rank of captain. About 1886, records show him in Solemnsville, Arizona, teaching school. But shortly afterward, he shows up in Mesilla, New Mexico, as co-owner of the fully Spanish language newspaper, El Defensor de Pueblo. At that time, Mesilla, the Mesilla Independent also printed a Spanish version, version of their paper. Before starting his paper uh, in Mesilla, Pedro married a woman named Lily Ward. And Lily Ward was the granddaughter of Rafael Ruelas. Rafael led the colony, the colonization of the Mesilla land grant. He was very prominent. Uh, he was a uh, he was the office of, or he, he held the office of Justice of the Peace as well as probate judge at some point in his career. Uh, Rafael and his wife Blasa had several children, one of who was Ma Maria Ward. Maria Ward was married to a hotel owner named John Ward, and those are Lily's parents. It's not clear when the Wards met Pedro, but at some point they're all in Clifton, Arizona, where Lily and Pedro married. Lily's 18 years old and Pedro is 33. The week that Pedro and Lily marry, they make front page news twice. Uh, on the same day, one for their wedding announcement and one for a home invasion, an attack from a jealous suitor of Lily's. Uh, the suitor tries to kill both Pedro and Lily while they're eating breakfast at home. And it's, it's a very long drawn out dramatic story in the newspaper. And if anyone's interested in seeing it, I saved it because I, I found it very interesting. Uh, just, just seems like his luck actually. Um, Pedro and Lily had five sons by the time she dies at, at age 34. Her death record states that she died of blood poisoning, but interestingly, she died one month after filing a will and leaving everything to Pedro, including her home and property in Mesilla left to her by her grandfather, Rafael Ruelas. 
In 1908, Pedro marries Enriquita McKay. She's the daughter of a wealthy Arizona mine owner. Uh, Pedro is 41 at this time and Enriquita is 19. They have four daughters together and she dies at age 44 of a non-traumatic brain congestion. Uh, I think they considered that a stroke back then. I think that's what we would call today a stroke. During his life, Pedro is consistently in the newspaper, attracting negative publicity from the Anglo newspapers and positive publicity from his Hispanic followers. He was an activist as well as a journalist. And so right underneath the photo here uh, that I got from the Arizona State University, um, they, the papers called him an anarchist. They called him a rapist. He was accused of rape at one time. They called him a smuggler because he was bringing in movies from Mexico that showed Mexicans in a positive light. They weren't always the bandidos that the American films portrayed them to be. So he wanted to show some good films <laughs> that portrayed Mexicans in a good way. They would call him belligerent, you know, when he was in court, his court proceedings all the time, he was in court for something. But the Mexican followers would call him El Profesor, they would call him a gentleman, they would call him a defender, they would call him a saint. So they're very two different point of views of him. But because of these tra uh, traumatic experiences he had, he decided to form some uh, social and beneficial organizations. Um, he started the Sociedad Zaragoza organization. It was a fraternal organization as well as a beneficial organization. And in his ads in the paper, he claims that he will accept uh, anyone, male or female. And then he says, except for Blacks, Chinese, and Japanese. So I think this at this point when Jennifer and I read that, it made us like question him a little bit because we were so proud of his advocacy and we were sad to see that he did have his own prejudices. By 1907, he had organized so many lodges for Zaragoza, uh, Sociedad uh, Zaragoza. He had lodges in Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. And uh, for 1907, he had over 2,000 members, which is pretty good because they didn't have the internet. Um, he also spearheaded a lot of organizations that didn't really last very long. And we think uh, this, we're not really sure why they didn't stick as, as much, you know, he would start them and then they would fail. And until he joined a group of powerful businessmen in Arizona and formed a league. And um, I'll have Jennifer tell you about that. Yes, as, um, as Penny mentioned, um, Pedro joined forces with other men um, and formed La Liga Protectora Latina, which was founded in Arizona in 1915. And its main mission was to provide financial support uh, to unemployed and ill members, um, along with assisting with funeral costs. Um, while in existence, the, um, the LPL, which is short, which I'll be uh, referring to La Liga Protectora, um, provided education and social assistance. And the group also supported labor and civil rights uh, for Mexican, Mexican immigrants. Initially, their focus um, was uh, based in Arizona, uh, but this expanded to other parts of the Southwest. As the uh, LPL gained momentum, the organization increased in membership, and soon they, they had a, a, a motto or slogan, uh, which was known as Uno para todos, todos para uno. As you can see in this timeline, I've highlighted some important milestone, milestones of LPL. Backtracking a year before um, LPL was created, in 1914, um, a meeting was held in, in Phoenix, uh, which involved pioneer members, um, which uh, Teddy touched on earlier, which included Ignacio Espinosa, uh, Pedro, and also Jesus Valendres. Um, these men initially thought of forming a mutual aid society to protect and educate Mexican American citizens of Arizona. In 1915, a meeting was held in Phoenix in opposition of the House Bill 54, which was known as Claypool Kinney Bill. This is where the formation of LPL began due to the mass meeting in opposition of the House Bill. So, a quick rundown on the House Bill um, this House Bill would prohibit the employment of hazardous, hazardous occupation of anyone deaf or who could not speak or read English. Um, this uh, directly impacted the minorities. Um, and uh, due to the house, due to the house bill, more than 600 people gathered and drew, drew up a petition and submitted it to the state legislature. 
the expulsion of non-speaking workers discriminated in favor of Englishmen and against Mexican descent. The meeting held on, nine, on February 1915. The outcome was that officers were elected and Pedro Garcia de la Lama was chosen as the organization's first, um, as a president. In May 1915, LPL had 80 members. Two months later, um, it increased to 115 members with a total of 15 people were awaiting membership. Um, this newly established organization grew quickly in Arizona and soon had lodges in other states. Lodge One was based in Tempe and they formed an employment bureau and financially they were able to assist members until they were able to lo locate employment and membership increased. In uh, July 1915, uh, due to the popularity of LPL, um, the organization had a convention in Phoenix in 1916. And due to its continued growth, the organization was classified as a nonprofit in Arizona. Uh, the, official, the official incorporation occurred in um, August 1916. So in uh, July or in January 1919, LPL success, successfully negotiated, negotiated a merger with a uh, La Liga Protectora Mexicana, uh, based out of Los Angeles, California. Um, so uh, with that being said, LPL chapters increase, or spread um, into California, uh, here in New Mexico, and as far as Pennsylvania. Um, to stay in communication with other members um, from different lodges, uh, an official publication was um, created, which is known as La Justicia. It was distributed in, 19, uh, in February 1919. And uh, while researching, we, we found out that uh, Pedro uh, served as, a, as the editor up until um, his time of death. So he was really instrumental um, with um, forming the, the publication of La Justicia. By 1920, uh, the Phoenix chapter of LPL had over 300 members and over 4,000 across the Southwest. But membership declined during the 1920s due to internal issues. Some of the issues in, included um, change in leadership and increased dues. Due to the internal issues, the organization lost momentum and LPL remained active until the Great Depression. While in existence, um, the LPL served to protect the interests of Mexican Americans and most importantly, preserve their culture and dignity. Upon termination of LPL, Federal continued its newspaper publications and fighting against injustices of Mexican Americans until his death of, uh, at the age of 92. Um, so that was you know, one of the major uh, benefits that, uh, that he, um, that you provided. Um, so we have listed here um, resources um, that you may you know, view to, uh, to look at historical newspaper agenda. Here uh, we have the University Library online catalog to search our different holdings related to Hispanic um, heritage. Also you can, the newspaper archive database, the New Mexico historical newspapers and Chronicling America. Um, thank you again for uh, tuning in and I guess right, or if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Hi, Sally. Thank you, guys. Hi, Teddy. It's good to see you. <laughs> and Jennifer. <laughs> How have you been? Good, thank you. It's glad to know the archives is still over there. I have all kinds of stuff to bring you, but I figured you've been on hiatus. <laughs> We're still here researching away and working. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting, you know. There's much Some more we felt just to you know bring it, you know, with a, a quick um, synopsis of up. yeah of. Uh, Pedro and, and, and the Spanish language newspapers, but thank you for tuning in. Well, thank you. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Thank you. So I see we have a question. Um, what was the name of the story of the letters? Uh, are, are you talking about the story by Cidro Armijo? Uh, that one, in, in English, it was called 60 Minutes in Hades. OK, yeah. So in English, it was called 60 Minutes in Hades. And in Spanish, it was called Sesenta Minutos en los Infiernos. And it's a short story. Do you want to know the book it was printed in? 
I'm not telling you, Vita. Vita's asking if he commits suicide. I'm not telling you. You have to read it. It's four pages long. <laughs> so we have a question here. Um, do these? Oh, let me scroll up really quick. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers. Uh, do these documents become a separate collection, or how would you go about finding these documents? So these um these documents that we that uh, Teddy found, it was just by you know one search led you know uh, within the newspaper database. She uh, you know found a uh, you know that uh, that piece of information, but um, they're not part of a, a collection that we have here. Um, but we do, like I said, we do hold the uh, news newspapers, um, uh, the physical formats um, here in the archives. But yeah, um, thanks for that question. Let's see. And then, can you tell them what? Or can you show the the resources again? Sure. We're we're going to put the resources up again because the 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 type no the resources or oh, sorry okay. the references sorry. So the second to the last one, the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature, is where you will find um, Isidoro's Armijo story, uh, plus a lot of others. I was telling Jennifer she has to read that book. I I fell in love with it so. It's on my it's on my uh, reading reading list for sure. It has a lot of uh, local um, names that original names that that are familiar, which I never knew they even existed in this anthology. So I recommend it as well. And if you want, go to the uh, lib.nmsu.edu uh, web uh, web page, and you can view our holdings here at uh, at our uh, library. Thank you. I think so far we've gone through all the questions in the chats, but um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to type them in, or if you guys want to uh, say them directly, that's fine with us as well. Bye. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis just put the papers that, that are, that, are those at UNM, right? No, it's, it's uh, our collection. We have his, co we have collection of Isidoro Mijo. Oh, we should put that up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. If you guys uh, think about other questions um, after the presentation, feel free to send us a, an email. Um, and I believe if I can get to that page really quick. Um, they are listed uh, here. So if you guys don't have a chance to ask your questions now, uh, feel free to send us an email. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.